at ECC at 11 o'clock is when the boutique opens. When the boutique opens. Yes, we're going to have live entertainment this year. It's, it's, we're going to have men escorts in Texas. Ooh. Ooh. I like it. And so the money that's raised, what's, what's going it on with that? It is going to the carry home this year. Last year we were able to donate $800 to Trinity Mission, and we're hoping to um, beat that. And we actually have a lot of um, participation from the carry home this year, so it's really exciting. It sounds like you guys have a great time. Um, it's, you know, it's a bunch of women getting together, making friends. I mean, that was one of the big goals was to meet and get to know each other and build relationships, and we're truly doing that. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for bearing with us. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we have a reason for joy that is beyond all understanding. I'm sure the world would look at somebody who has completely and totally fallen in love with you and be in complete wonder and wonder what this religion thing is all about. Is, is it even more than religion? Does religion even encapsulate it? Heavenly Father, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Every day is, um, you're, not, you're not promising just a, a smooth skate, but you are promising that you're going to be there for us and be there right there with us and what we're, what we're in. Thank you for this time to come together as your, your family, as brothers and sisters in your church community. Thank you for, for sharing with us your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, normally, I just ignore the doorbell, but on this day, I answered. And there stood two boys, each about 19, in white starch short sleeve shirts, and they had little name tags that identified them as official representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they said they had a message for me from God. And they told me the story all about this guy named Lehi who lived in Jerusalem in 600 B.C. Now, apparently, in Jerusalem in 600 B.C., everyone was completely bad and evil, every single one of them, man, woman, child, infant, fetus. And God came to Lehi and said to him, put your family on a boat and I will lead you out of here. And God did lead them. He led them to America. I said, America? From Jerusalem to America by boat in 600 B.C.? But apparently somebody blew it because the Lamanites were able to kill all the Nephites. All but one guy, this guy named Mormon, who managed to survive by hiding in the woods. And he made sure this whole story was written down in reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics chiseled onto gold plates, which he then buried near Palmyra, New York. <laughs> then they told me how this guy named Joseph Smith found the, those buried gold plates right in his backyard. And, and he also found this magic stone back there that he put into his hat and then buried his face into. And this allowed him to translate the gold plates from the reformed Egyptian into English. <laughs> Well, at this point, I just wanted to give these two boys some advice about their pitch. <laughs> I wanted to say, okay, don't start with this story. I mean, even the Scientologists know to start with a personality test before they start <laughs> telling people all about Xenu, the evil intergalactic overlord. Okay, so I initially felt really superior to these boys and smug in my more conventional faith. But then the more I thought about it, the more I had to be honest with myself. If someone came to my door and I was hearing Catholic theology and dogma for the very first time, and they said, we believe that God impregnated a very young girl, and the fact that she was a virgin is maniacally important to us, <laughs> and she had a baby, and... That's the Son of God. I mean, I would think that's equally ridiculous. I'm just so used to that story. When I was younger, I had the privilege of um, engaging a couple Mormon missionaries in conversation. And we spent a couple weeks digging into the differences between our various faiths. In fact, when I was in high school, I was very fascinated by the other religion kind of study. I wanted to learn all I could about the other people's beliefs and what they, what they did believe. And I found out that the more I learned about other religions, the more easy it was to ridicule them. Because you always find these things that seem outlandish. 
And there at the very end, she mentioned something. Uh, this is from Julia Sweeney. She is an atheist now, has given up on God entirely. I don't necessarily agree with her giving up on God entirely, but uh, that's a story of someone who has kind of lost her religion, so to speak. She has realized that her own beliefs are just enculturated into her, not necessarily her own. And she realizes that the religion she has was sort of ridiculous. We live in a society that has learned this simple truth. It is that from the outsider's perspective, almost all religious beliefs are ridiculous. From the outsider's perspective, can you really believe that Moses raised a stick and the waters in the Red Sea parted left to right and they walked through? From an outsider's perspective, can you really believe that God made a bush turn on fire and it didn't burn up? From an outsider's perspective, can you really believe some of these things? Well, from an outsider's perspective is what most of our world is now. And they have realized that religion is something to play games with and to make fun of. And so we live in a society now where it's becoming more and more ridiculed. I want to read to you a section from a, a, a speech that a man named Bertrand Russell gave many years ago. Back in 1927, he gave a speech called, Why I Am Not a Christian. And I'm just going to read through a couple paragraphs of this. He says, that's the idea that we should all be wicked if we did not hold to the Christian religion. It seems to me that the people who have held to it have been, for the most part, extremely wicked. You find this curious fact, that the more intense has been the religion of any period, and the more profound has been the dogmatic belief, the greater has been the cruelty, and the worse has been the state of affairs. In the so-called ages of faith, when men really did believe the Christian religion, in all its completeness, there was the Inquisition with all its tortures. There were millions of unfortunate women burned as witches. And there was every kind of cruelty practiced upon all sorts of people in the name of religion. You find as you look around the world that every single bit of progress in humane feeling, every improvement in the criminal law, every step toward the diminution of war, every step toward better treatment of the colored races, or every mitigation of slavery, every moral progress that there has been in the world has been consistently opposed by the organized churches of the world. I say quite deliberately that the Christian religion, as organized in its churches, has been and still is the principal enemy of moral progress in the world.